Hello and welcome to Multidimensional Integration, a new video series where we discuss how to solve integrals in higher dimensions. This means we will talk about the general rules we have for integrals of functions defined on Rn. And indeed, the starting approach here will be the common Lebesgue measure and the associated Lebesgue integral. These two things give us a solid mathematical framework such that we can prove all the properties of the integrals. However, before we go into the details here, I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And as for all my video series, with the link in the description, you can download additional material for the videos. Most importantly, you find quizzes which test your knowledge and PDF versions for the videos. And now let's immediately start by first telling you what things you need to understand this new video course. First, some rough knowledge of measure theory is needed such that you can understand the definitions of the integrals we will consider. Of course, it would be really nice to have the whole technical tool set of measure theory ready here, but it's not strictly necessary. But I would say at least you should have seen the definition of a measure and the general Lebesgue integral. And then on the other hand, the video course about multivariable calculus is also helpful here. In fact, there we have the same case as for the measure theory course. You don't need to have the whole knowledge in mind, but some core definitions are necessary. So for example, you need to know partial derivatives and the Jacobian. And there we have it, these are the two important prerequisites I recommend, and then you can start with this multidimensional integration course. And moreover, I can also tell you, after watching this video series here, you are also prepared for a more general case. Namely, then you can do integration on generalized surfaces called manifolds. In fact, a lot of ideas we have for the integration on surfaces are much clearer if we formulate them on manifolds. Hence, if you are interested in that, please check out my manifolds series. However, in this video course here, we keep it simpler because we will do integrations on Rn. And indeed, we will immediately start with the definitions for such integrals. And then we will see that we can do a lot of nice stuff with these integrals, for example, we can generalize the substitution rule. And this is commonly known as the change of variables formula. Indeed, this will be one of two important tools we need to solve explicit integrals as well. And the other important tool for solving integrals is the so-called Frobenius theorem. Or more precisely, what we will use is often called frobenius tonelli theorem by some people. So first we will explain the proofs of these important concepts and then we will apply them to explicit integrals. So I think it's really important to do some explicit integrations such that you can see how nice the whole theory really is. Okay, so this is the rough plan for the whole series and I would say we can immediately start with the definitions we need. So now is the point where I tell you what we actually need from measure theory. And it turns out that the starting point is the so-called Lebesgue measure on R. So to put it in other words, we start with the one-dimensional case first. Hence, first you have to know how to measure one-dimensional volumes, so lengths. This means a subset on the real number line here should have a well-defined length. So for example, we already know what this means for an interval on the real number line. So if it starts with the point A and ends with the point B on the right, we know that the length is given by B minus A. And more precisely, we would write it as mu of this interval is given by B minus A. And obviously, we only want to have this formula in the case that B is bigger than A. Therefore, the result here is that we already have a length measurement for intervals. And in the measure theory series we learn that such a function mu is called a pre-measure. It's not a full measure as we want it yet, 
because it only works on the intervals and not on more subsets of R. However, the important thing is that in measure theory we have a very nice theorem. It's called Kara Theodori's extension theorem and it allows us to extend such a pre-measure. In the first step of this extension we get a function phi which is defined on the whole power set of R. So for this function we can put in any subset of R. And what comes out is either a positive number or the symbol infinity. So please remember that in measure theory we always include the symbol infinity in the interval as well. And moreover the technical term we have for this function phi is outer measure. But it's not so important right now. If you want to have the technical explanations, please check out the last part of the measure theory series. For us here, it's just important that with this outer measure, we can define a sigma algebra. And this one is usually denoted by a curved A with index phi. The notion of a sigma algebra is really important because there we find all the sets where we can actually measure the length of. Therefore, what we have here is the sigma algebra of Lebesgue measurable sets. And for this, I just want to use a curved L of R. So again, this sigma algebra here consists of subsets of the set R. And most importantly, L of R is not equal to the whole power set. In other words, there are some annoying sets which are not Lebesgue measurable. However, the good thing is that they usually don't occur in applications, so all the sets we want to measure we can find in L of R. Okay, and now I should tell you that this whole procedure here with pre-measure and outer measure leads us to a proper measure in the end. Hence what we get here is what we call the Lebesgue measure and denote by lambda. And it is defined on this whole sigma algebra L of R. So this is what we want, this is our one-dimensional Lebesgue measure. And it does exactly what we want, it generalizes the measurement of lengths of intervals. So after this whole construction procedure we can forget about the other notions because we just need this notion measure. And now what this actually means, we can put in the properties of the Lebesgue measure. Indeed, a measure has two defining properties. First, it needs to map the empty set to zero. And second, it has to be sigma additive. The meaning of that is, if we put in a countable union into lambda, then a sum or series comes out. More precisely, we have j goes from 1 to infinity and we have lambda of aj. And of course, we need some requirements for these sets aj. First, they need to be Lebesgue measurable, so they come from our sigma algebra. This makes sense, because otherwise we could not put them into our measure at all. However, they should also be pairwise disjoint. Which simply means that for two different indices, we always get out the empty set if we form the intersection. And there we have it, this whole property here is what we call sigma additivity. In our case this property is easy to understand because it just means if you have a given set, so a subset in R which is measurable, then you can split it up into countable many parts and then you can just calculate the lengths of the different parts and they will add up to the length of the whole set. Indeed this is what we expect of a well-defined measure. However, please don't forget, here we have two key ingredients. First we need disjoint sets and we can only go to countable many. In fact, this property is also the reason why we want to have a sigma algebra. Okay, so these things are just the general properties a measure has, but for the Lebesgue measure we have even more. First of all, we can state that the sigma algebra of Lebesgue measurable sets is bigger than the common Borel sigma algebra. So in particular, the Borel sigma algebra is contained in L of R. So if you don't know the Borel sigma algebra, it's not a problem at all, but you should know that all open sets in R 
are included there. So in particular, we know that all open and closed sets in R are measurable. Moreover, we can say a lot about sets with measure 0. So if the length of A given by the Lebesgue measure lambda of A is 0, then we often call A a null set. Indeed, this is a common term we have in measure theory. However, for such a null set, it turns out that every subset is also a null set. So maybe this is not so surprising, because each subset B in A should be smaller or equal in length. And obviously, 0 is already the smallest length we can have. Indeed, the whole claim here is a little bit subtle, because it just means that a subset is also measurable. Hence, B here is also in the Lebesgue sigma algebra. And indeed, this is the important difference we have from the Borel sigma algebra. In fact, we will see that this property is really helpful for defining and calculating integrals. But before we do that, let's first discuss two more properties of the Lebesgue measure. By construction, we know what it does for intervals. Namely, it just gives us the normal length for an interval a, b. This property is like a normalization, because it tells us that the unit interval has length 1. And the second property is that the Lebesgue measure is translation invariant. It tells us that if we have a given measurable set A and we shift it by a point X, then this translation does not change the measure of A at all. So this holds for all points X in R and for all measurable sets A. So this is the property we call translation invariance, and you can remember that because it also holds for the n-dimensional Lebesgue measure later. Okay, so now we have a well-defined measure with some additional properties, and as always, for a measure, we can define an integral. And in general, this integral is always called the Lebesgue integral, with respect to the given measure. And now what we will use in this course is the general Lebesgue integral with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Hence, we will use different notations, which all mean the same thing. The standard one would be integral of f over a. And then we write d lambda to denote the Lebesgue measure. And of course, here a is a given Lebesgue measurable subset of r. And equivalently, you also see this notation where we use a variable x inside. Which means we would write f of x d lambda x. Obviously, that is what one uses in calculation, because then we don't need a name for the function. And since here we will always deal with the Lebesgue measure, we can also shorten the notation. Which means we completely omit lambda and just write dx. Still, it should denote a Lebesgue integral, so the measure is just hidden in dx. And now as a reminder, the Lebesgue integral is defined as an approximation with simple functions. These are also often called step functions, but these are step functions in the Lebesgue sense. So in this case, they are more general than the Riemann step functions you might know from the Riemann integral. Now the explicit definition of this approximation is given in the measure theory course, but here I can give you a picture of the idea. So first, the function f should be given as a non-negative function. And then a simple function is just a function where the set of values is finite. And here we just want that the simple function lies pointwisely below the graph of f. And then we see that for the simple function we don't have any problems looking at the pre-images on the x-axis. So for example, for this given value, the preimage consists of these two parts here. And now of this whole set, we can calculate the Lebesgue measure. And the number we get out here, we can multiply by the value we have here. So what we get are the areas here. Hence, in the end, when we add up all these numbers, we get an approximation of the area between the x-axis and the graph of the function. And then in the last step, we just form a supremum over all these approximations from below. So most importantly, in the case you only know the Riemann integral, 
you should note that we approximate exactly the same area here. So in fact, the Lebesgue integral gives us exactly the same number as the Riemann integral. It just turns out that the Lebesgue integral also works in cases where the Riemann integral fails. And that's one of the reasons we immediately go with the Lebesgue integral in this series. And the other reason is that for the Lebesgue integral, we can make the jump to Rn in a much easier way than for the Riemann integral. Indeed, with the next video, we can immediately define the n-dimensional Lebesgue measure and the n-dimensional Lebesgue integral. So I really hope we meet there again and have a nice day. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.